Chapter One of Pauline's Passion and Punishment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Pauline's Passion and Punishment by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter One To and Fro like a wild creature in its cage, paced that handsome woman, with bent head, locked hands, and restless steps. Some mental storm, swift and sudden as a tempest of the tropics, had swept over her and left its marks behind. As if in anger at the beauty now proved powerless, all ornaments had been flung away, yet still it shone undimmed, and filled her with a passionate regret. A jewel glittered at her feet, leaving the lace rent to shreds on the indignant bosom that had worn it. The wreaths of hair that had crowned her with a woman's most womanly adornment fell disordered upon shoulders that gleamed the fairer for the scarlet of the pomegranate flowers clinging to the bright meshes that had imprisoned them an hour ago. And over the face, once so affluent in youthful bloom, a stern pallor had fallen, like a blight, for pride was slowly conquering passion, and despair had murdered hope. Pausing in her troubled march, she swept away the curtain swaying in the wind and looked out, as if imploring help from nature, the great mother of us all. A summer moon rode high in a cloudless heaven, and far as eye could reach stretched the green wilderness of a Cuban capital. No forest, but a tropical orchard, rich in lime, banana, plantain, palm, and orange trees, under whose protective shade grew the evergreen coffee plant, whose dark red berries are the fortune of their possessor, and the luxury of one half the world. Wide avenues diverging from the mansion, with its belt of brilliant shrubs and flowers, formed shadowy vistas, along which, on the wings of the wind, came a breath of far-off music, like a wooing voice. For the magic of night and distance lulled the cadence of a Spanish contradanza to a trance of sound, soft, subdued, and infinitely sweet. It was a southern scene, but not a southern face that looked out upon it with such unerring glance. There was no southern languor in the figure, stately and erect, no southern swarthiness on fairest cheek and arm, no southern darkness in the shadowy gold of the neglected hair. The light frost of northern snows lurked in the features, delicately cut, yet vividly alive, betraying a temperament ardent, dominant, and subtle. For passion burned in the deep eyes, changing their violet to black. Pride sat on the forehead with its dark brows. All a woman's sweetest spells touched the lips, whose shape was a smile, and in the spirited carriage of the head appeared the freedom of an intellect ripened under colder skies, the energy of a nature that could wring strength from suffering, and dare to act where feebler souls would only dare desire. Standing thus, conscious only of the wound that bled in that high heart of hers, and the longing that gradually took shape and deepened to a purpose, the alien presence changed the tragic atmosphere of that still room and woke her from her dangerous mood. A wonderfully winning guise this apparition wore, for youth, hope, and love endowed it with the charm that gives beauty to the plainest, while their reign endures. A boy in any other climate, in this his nineteen years had given him the stature of a man, and Spain, the land of romance, seemed embodied in this figure, full of the lithe slenderness of the whispering palms overhead, the warm colouring of the deep-toned flowers sleeping in the room, the native grace of the tame antelope lifting its human eyes to his, as he lingered on the threshold, in an attitude eager yet timid, watching that other figure, as it looked into the night, and found no solace there. Pauline! She turned as if her thought had taken voice and answered her, regarded him a moment, as if hesitating to receive the granted wish, then beckoned with the one word. Come. Instantly the fear vanished, the ardor deepened, and with an imperious, Lie down, to his docile attendant, the young man obeyed with equal docility, looking as wistfully toward his mistress as the brute toward her master, 
while he waited proudly humble for her commands. "'Manuel, why are you here?' "'Forgive me. I saw Dolores bring you a letter. You vanished, an hour passed. I could wait no longer, and I came.' "'I am glad. I needed my one friend. Read that.' She offered a letter, and with her steady eyes upon him, her purpose strengthening as she looked, stood watching the changes of that expressive countenance. This was the letter. Pauline. Six months ago I left you, promising to return and take you home my wife. I loved you, but I deceived you, for though my heart was wholly yours, my hand was not mine to give. This it was that haunted me through all that blissful summer, this that marred my happiness when you owned you loved me, and this drove me from you, hoping I could break the tie with which I had rashly bound myself. I could not. I am married, and there all ends. Hate me, forget me, solace your pride with the memory that none knew your wrong, assure your peace with the knowledge that mine is destroyed forever, and leave my punishment to remorse and time. Gilbert with a gesture of wrathful contempt, Manuel flung the paper from him as he flashed a look at his companion, muttering through his teeth, "'Traitor! Shall I kill him?' Pauline laughed low to herself, a dreary sound, but answered with a slow darkening of the face that gave her words an ominous significance. "'Why should you? Such revenge is brief and paltry, fit only for mock tragedies or poor souls who have the neither the will to devise nor the will to execute a better. There are fates more terrible than death, weapons more keen than poniards, more noiseless than pistols. Women use such, and work out a subtler vengeance than men can conceive. Leave Gilbert to remorse, and me. She paused an instant and by some strong effort banished the black frown from her brow, quenched the baleful fire of her eyes, and left nothing visible but the pale determination that made her beautiful face more eloquent than her words. Manuel, in a week I leave the island. Alone, Pauline? No, not alone. A moment they looked into each other's eyes, each endeavouring to read the other. Manuel saw some indomitable purpose, bent on conquering all obstacles. Pauline saw doubt, desire, and hope, knew that a word would bring the ally she needed, and, with a courage as native to her as her pride, resolved to utter it. Seating herself, she beckoned her companion to assume the place beside her, but for the first time he hesitated. Something in the unnatural calmness of her manner troubled him, for his southern temperament was alive to influences whose presence would have been unfelt by one less sensitive. He took the cushion at her feet, saying, half tenderly, half reproachfully, "'Let me keep my old place till I know in what character I am to fit the new. The man you trusted has deserted you. The boy you pitied will prove loyal. Try him, Pauline.' "'I will.' And with the bitter smile unchanged upon her lips, the low voice unshaken in its tones, the deep eyes unwavering in their gaze, Pauline went on. You know my past, happy as a dream till eighteen. Then all was swept away, home, fortune, friends, and I was left like an unfledged bird without even the shelter of a cage. For five years I have made my life what I could, humble, honest, but never happy, till I came here, for here I saw Gilbert. In the poor companion of your guardian's daughter he seemed to see the heiress I had been, and treated me as such. This flattered my pride and touched my heart. He was kind, I grateful. Then he loved me, and God knows how utterly I loved him. A few months of happiness the purest, then he went to make a home ready for me, and I believed him for where I wholly love I wholly trust. While my own peace was undisturbed I learned to read the language of your eyes, Manuel, to find the boy grown into the man, the friend warmed into a lover. Your youth had kept me blind too long. Your society had grown dear to me, and I loved you like a sister for your unvarying kindness to the solitary woman who earned her bread and found it bitter. 
I told you my secret to prevent the utterance of your own. You remember the promise you made me then. Keep it still, and bury the knowledge of my lost happiness deep in your pitying heart, as I shall in my proud one. Now the storm is over, and I am ready for my work again. But it must be a new task in a new scene. I hate this house, this room, the faces I must meet, the duties I must perform, for the memory of that traitor haunts them all. I see a future full of interest, a stage whereon I could play a stirring part. I long for it intensely, yet cannot make it mine alone. Manuel, do you love me still? Bending suddenly, she brushed back the dark hair that streaked his forehead, and searched the face that in an instant answered her. Like a swift rising light, the eloquent blood rushed over swarthy cheek and brow, the slumberous softness of the eyes kindled with a flash, and the lips, sensitive as any woman's, trembled yet broke into a rapturous smile as he cried with fervent brevity, "'I would die for you!' A look of triumph swept across her face, for with this boy, as chivalrous as ardent, she knew that words were not mere breath. Still, with her stern purpose uppermost, she changed the bitter smile into one half timid, half tender, as she bent nearer. Manuel, in a week I leave the island. Shall I go alone? No, Pauline. He understood her now. She saw it in the sudden paleness that fell on him, heard it in the rapid beating of his heart, felt it in the strong grasp that fastened on her hand, and knew that the first step was won. A regretful pang smote her, but the dark mood which had taken possession of her stifled the generous warnings of her better self, and drove her on. Listen, Manuel, a strange spirit rules me to-night, but I will have no reserves from you, all shall be told. Then, if you will come, be it so. If not, I shall go my way as solitary as I came. If you think that this loss has broken my heart, undeceive yourself, for such as I live years in an hour and show no sign. I have shed no tears, uttered no cry, asked no comfort. Yet since I read that letter I have suffered more than many suffer in a lifetime. I am not one to lament long over any hopeless sorrow. A single paroxysm, sharp and short, and it is over. Contempt has killed my love, I have buried it, and no power can make it live again, except as a pale ghost that will not rest till Gilbert shall pass through an hour as bitter as the last. Is that the task you give yourself, Pauline? The savage element that lurks in southern blood leaped up in the boy's heart as he listened, glittered in his eye, and involuntarily found expression in the nervous grip of the hands that folded a fairer one between them. Alas for Pauline, that she had roused the sleeping devil, and was glad to see it. Yes, it is weak, wicked, and unwomanly, yet I persist as relentlessly as any Indian on a war-trail. See me as I am, not the gay girl you have known, but a revengeful woman with but one tender spot now left in her heart, the place you fill. I have been wronged, and I long to right myself at once. Time is too slow, I cannot wait, for that man must be taught that too can play at the game of hearts, taught soon and sharply. I can do this, can wound as I have been wounded, can sting him with contempt, and prove that I too can forget. Go on, Pauline, show me how I am to help you. Manuel, I want fortune, rank, splendor, and power. You can give me all these, and a faithful friend besides. I desire to show Gilbert the creature he deserted no longer poor, unknown, unloved, but lifted higher than himself, cherished, honored, applauded, her life one of royal pleasure, herself a happy queen. Beauty, grace, and talent you tell me I possess. Wealth gives them lustre, rank exalts them, power makes them irresistible. Place these worldly gifts in my hand, and that hand is yours. See, I offer it. She did so, but it was not taken. Manuel had left his seat and now stood before her, awed by the undertone of strong emotion in her calmly spoken words, bewildered by the proposal so abruptly made, 
longing to ask the natural question hovering on his lips, yet too generous to utter it. Pauline read his thoughts, and answered it with no touch of pride or pain in the magical voice that seldom spoke in vain. I know your wish. It is as just as your silence is generous, and I reply to it in all sincerity. You would ask, when I have given all that I possess, what do I receive in return? This. A wife whose friendship is as warm as many a woman's love, a wife who will give you all the heart still left her, and cherish the hope that time may bring a harvest of real affection to repay you for the faithfulness of years, who, though she takes the retribution of a wrong into her hands and executes it in the face of heaven, never will forget the honourable name you give into her keeping, or blemish it by any act of hers. I can promise no more. Will this content you, Manuel? Before she ended, his face was hidden in his hands, and tears streamed through them as he listened, for like a true child of the South each emotion found free vent and spent itself as swiftly as it rose. The reaction was more than he could bear, for in a moment his life was changed, months of hopeless longing were banished with a word, a blissful yes cancelled the hard no that had been accepted as inexorable, and happiness, lifting her full cup to his lips, bade him drink. A moment he yielded to the natural relief, then dashed his tears away, and threw himself at Pauline's feet, in that attitude fit only for a race as graceful as impassioned. Forgive me, Take all I have, fortune, name, and my poor self. Use us as you will. We are proud and happy to be spent for you. No service will be too hard, no trial too long. If in the end you learn to love me with one tithe of the affection I have made my life. Do you mean it? Am I to go with you? To be near you always, to call you my wife, and know we are each other's until death? What have I ever done to earn a fate like this? Fast and fervently he spoke, and very winsome was the glad abandonment of this young lover, half boy, half man, possessing the simplicity of the one, the fervor of the other. Pauline looked and listened with a soothing sense of consolation in the knowledge that this loyal heart was all her own, a sweet foretaste of the devotion which henceforth was to shelter her from poverty, neglect, and wrong and turn life's sunniest side to one who had so long seen only its most bleak and barren. Still at her feet, his arms about her waist, his face flushed and proud, lifted to hers, Manuel saw the cold mask soften, the stern eyes melt with a sudden dew, as Pauline watched him, saying, "'Dear Manuel, love me less. I am not worth such ardent and entire faith. Pause and reflect before you take this step. I will not bind you to my fate too soon, lest you repent too late. We both stand alone in the world, free to make or mar our future as we will. I have chosen my lot. Recall all it may cost you to share it, and be sure the price is not too high a one. Remember that I am poor, you the possessor of one princely fortune, the sole heir to another." the knowledge of this burdened me before. Now I glory in it, because I have the more for you. Remember I am older than yourself, and may early lose the beauty you love so well, leaving an old wife to burden your youth. What are a few years to me? Women like you go lovelier with age, and you shall have a strong young husband to lean on all your life. Remember I am not of your faith, and the priests will shut me out from your heaven. Let them prate as they will. Where you go, I will go. Santa Paula shall be my Madonna. Remember, I am a deserted woman, and in the world we are going to my name may become the sport of that man's cruel tongue. Could you bear that patiently and curb your fiery pride if I desired it? Anything for you, Pauline. One thing more. I give you my liberty. For a time give me forbearance in return and though wed in haste, woo me slowly, lest this sore heart of mine find even your light yoke heavy. Can you promise this, and wait till time has healed my wound, and taught me to be meek? I swear to obey you in all things. Make me what you will. 
for soul and body I am wholly yours henceforth. Faithful and true, I knew you would not fail me. Now go, Manuel, to-morrow do your part resolutely as I shall do mine, and in a week we will begin the new life together. Ours is a strange betrothal, but it shall not lack some touch of tenderness for me. Love, good night. Pauline bent till her bright hair mingled with the dark, kissed the boy on lips and forehead, as a fond sister might have done, then put him gently from her, and like one in a blessed dream he went away to pace all night beneath her window, longing for the day. As the echo of his steps died along the corridor, Pauline's eye fell on the paper lying where her lover had flung it. At this sight all the old softness vanished, the stern woman reappeared, and crushing it in her hand with slow significance, she said low to herself, This is an old, old story, but it shall have a new ending. End of chapter 1